in this inversion, uh, invert, always invert series. And this message is going to actually be flavored by the delightful experience that I had at the DMV uh, this last Monday. Had to go there to renew my license. My birthday was coming up, and I needed a real identity. So we drive an hour and a quarter to the fine town of Temecula, arrive there at 10 or 9.30 in the morning. I'm thinking that should be plenty of time. Trish has a couple of hours of, of uh, errands that she wanted to run. So I think a couple hours ought to do it. Uh, she drops me off. People are lined out the door, okay? So I had to wait my turn. I'm waiting for about 10 minutes outside in the blazing sun. And then when I get inside, I'm, I'm greeted by like this, just a um, sea of humanity. And that is a picture uh, from a DMV in our fine state. So uh, I'm inside about five minutes and all of a sudden, they, they make this general announcement. And the announcement is that there is a statewide crash of the computers. There will be no renewal of licenses today. There will be no renewal of registrations today. We can't help you in any way, shape, or form. Go home. Come back tomorrow. The man in front of me goes ballistic grabs a state worker, starts screaming up and down, and basically was, uh, well, his request, not so kindly made, was that the state should reimburse him for the day that he took off. And I'm thinking, yeah, I know how that conversation is going to go. So while this conversation is occurring, people are leaving in droves. And so by the time this guy got done um, and he leaves, I'm kind of looking around. There's no more entertainment there. And it's almost like a ghost town inside. Going to the DMV, and it's a ghost town? It's like, whoa, I should have taken a picture of that. I wasn't thinking, okay? So I'm thinking, what are, what are my options here? The entertainment is gone, and it's going to be a couple hours before Trish comes back with all of the details, or the, the uh, uh, errands. I'm thinking, I'll just wait here just in case, just on the off chance maybe. So I'm just kind of twiddling my thumbs for about 15 minutes. And then they start calling a number. And then a minute later, they call another number. And then another minute, they give me a number because I didn't have a number before. And so I'm thinking, what was absolutely horrible that the state is no longer able to do anything and all of these people left has turned into inverted upside down into this glorious blessing, and I'm thinking, that'll preach. And you know what? That's what's happening right now. So uh, 15, uh, it was just a glorious day, glorious day. So invert, reverse it. Uh, this is not very spiritual, but I'm going to throw it in anyway. If you spell diaper backwards, do you know what you get? Repaid. Yeah, think about that for a minute. Okay, let's go back to sp <laughs> spirituality. Jesus is a master at reversing things, turning things upside down, inverting, always inverting. The people who hung out with Jesus, they weren't super religious types. They were religious scoundrels, in fact, prostitutes, extortionists, he teaches, and all the wrong people seem to get it. And all the people you would suspect would get it uh, miss out entirely. So his very life, his teaching, is, is inversion. And he would teach and say, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. He would say, love your enemies, don't hate your enemies. He would say, if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you're going to find it. He would invert these all the time. And it's not just some nifty teaching technique to keep people a little off balance or to, to allow them to have a new little perspective. What Jesus is saying is you got it all backwards, all of it, not just the stuff on the periphery, at the very core. You've got it all backwards. You need to turn it around, your beliefs, your actions. So today, we're going to look that Jesus, by his life and by his teaching, is calling you and me to invert, to invert our whole approach to righteousness, our view of righteousness. How do you get right? How do you stay right? How do you, 
How do you be accepted by God to totally turn that up on its end? Because most of us have the wrong idea. We all have a hunger to be accepted. We all have a hunger to belong. We all have a hunger for approval. If you don't believe that, just go on Facebook or Instagram, okay? Religion, in terms of acceptance, religion tells you this. I obey so that I can be accepted. Jesus says, turn that upside down. I am accepted by God so that I can obey. Religion says you got to do this, you got to become that in order to get in to be accepted. Religion says it all hinges on you, what you do, what you say, what you avoid. But the attitude that results from people who feel like they kind of make some headway under that thought, that's a guaranteed creator for self-righteousness, for a kind of a, I'm better than you are, for I am definitely holier than you are attitude. That's what happens. So Jesus declares, you got to reverse it. you got to invert it. What if it doesn't hinge on what you do at all? What if it all hinges on what's been done for you? If Jesus is saying you're accepted, not based on what you've done, but what God has done for you. And he gives a parable to those who didn't believe that at all. It's the parable that I call the religious professional and the professional extortionist, because that's exactly what's happening. It's two individuals. The introduction to that parable that Pat read was that Jesus told this parable and he's telling it straight to the face of some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. This is a parable of courage. Jesus is speaking directly to proud, self-righteous people who feel that their religious record gets them in with God and makes them better than others. And this is one of those parables that is super clear and obvious what the meaning is. You know, most of Jesus' parables has the disciples afterward going, "Uh, Jesus, would you explain that to us? Not this parable. They know exactly what this parable is meaning when Jesus is giving it, and they're all whispering to each other, dang, the guy's got courage to say it in front of the powers that be. Okay, that's, that's what they're saying. The Pharisees, they could not hide the thought that they had that they're better than everyone else because they are holier than everyone else. Religious pride and self-righteousness, it will always have you doing a side glance to see how everyone else is doing, and guess what? You always come out on top. You always will if you're a proud, self-righteous Pharisee type. I grew up in a church like that with lots of people like that, and I know that because I was one of those people. I am a recovering, self-righteous, judgmental Pharisee. I am. And I'm not saying that to try to get your sympathy. I'm just stating the facts, ma'am, just the facts. So Jesus is telling this parable to me. And he begins the parable by saying, two men went up to the temple to pray. One's a Pharisee, the other's a tax collector. Now, when he's saying this parable, every listener knows how this should turn out. I mean, on the one hand, you've got a guy who is an upstanding um, leader of the community. He's religious, ultra-religious. And on the other hand, you've got an extortionist because that's exactly what tax collectors were. They were, they were uh, hired by Rome to gouge their fellow countrymen, skim off the top whatever they felt they could, give the money that was hard-earned, to the Romans, to the occupiers. They were traitors to their country. They were apostates to their religion. Everyone knows how this parable should turn out. Who goes away uh, righteous and accepted before God and who still stays a scoundrel? That's what they think. But as we see in a minute, there's a staggering reversal of that order in Jesus, of that conventional theology. So in the parable... The Pharisee's got his chest just swelling, okay? And he's doing, done his side glance, and he's saying, oh, God, I thank you that I'm not like everyone else here, especially not like that guy, that extortionist, okay? So he's always coming out on top, 
always coming out on top. He's trumpeting what Tim Keller, who is a Presbyterian pastor in New York, what Tim Keller calls a validating performance record. That's what the Pharisee thinks he's got. A validating performance record is the things you have accomplished in this life that are meant to open doors for you. It's what you put on your resume. It's your SAT score. It's your IQ. It's your accreditation. It's your certifications. It's your um, stock uh, accounts. In this world, if you got enough on your validating performance record, if you're good enough, if you performed well enough, if you've got enough, then you're admitted. You're accepted. You are bona fide. You're in. And because it's how it works in this world, religious people think that that's how it should work with God. So religion tells you you need to bolster your moral record of what you stay away from and of what you do how to establish your righteousness. You uh, pad that validated uh, performance record, you give it to God, and you know it's going to be enough. And if your record is thicker than someone else's record, then you can feel pretty smug about yourself. That's just the way it works, especially if you have checked off all the basic stuff, and right now you're already into the extra credit. Like in this parable, the Pharisee says, you know, I haven't done this, haven't done that, haven't done that. I've avoided all of that, and I fast twice a week. Nowhere in the Bible does God command his people to fast twice a week. So the Pharisee is in the extra credit region, he feels, and he feels that he's doing a great job. So bottom line, he's in essence saying, God, uh, you should accept me because of all that I do, my behavior. Now, that's the Pharisee. The extortionist, the tax collector, he takes a totally opposite approach. He knows he has nothing at all on his VPR or VR, yeah, validating performance record. He can't trumpet nothing. The only thing he's got to say, because he's off, standing off to the side, he's embarrassed even to raise his eyes to heaven, and he's got a very short prayer. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He's not doing a side glance, comparing himself to anybody else. Notice, this, notice that he calls himself not a sinner, just one among many. He calls himself the sinner, as if there's no one else in this frame besides a holy God and him. Be merciful to me, the sinner. In that short prayer, there's something else that he prays that's very powerful that you'd miss unless, of course, you read the original language, Greek. Uh, there's a rare, very rare word that is used for be merciful. It's a very specific word. It has a very specific application. Uh, in my Bible, on the side, it has a note that instead of be merciful, uh, it can also be propitious. Now, how many of you have ever used the word propitious before in any way, shape, or form? Because we don't use that word very often, they put in merciful, which is a better known word, but actually a softer word. It's a, it's a more generic kind of a word. This word pro, pro, uh, propitious, it's hiloskomai in the Greek. It, it, it has the flavor of atoning, atoning. So uh, it's used in the Greek form only one other place. It's in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, where it says that Jesus, by all that he did, by all that he said, by his sacrificial death, um, he did all of that to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So it's just these two places where that word is used. So when this man is crying, be merciful, be propitious to me, the sinner. Let me give you an example of what he's asking. I think this example, you're probably going to remember the example, but you're going to have a hard time. What was that word again? Propitious, propitious, propitiation. Um, later this week, Trish and I are going to get the privilege of going up to Monterey. You know, it's rough. You know, it's going to be 100 degrees here. It'll be 150 degrees here, and uh, it'll be nice and, nice and cool in Monterey because it's, it's car week. Now, the Monterey car week, it's, it's called the Concouche d'Elegance, uh, where anybody who's anybody in the car world will come and bring their wares. Jay Leno, he, he's there every year, brings a few of his cars. Uh, Lamborghinis are a dime a dozen, seriously. 
Ferraris, you see them on every street corner. You got the Bugattis, the McLarens, uh, and there's another car called a Koenigsegg. Anybody heard of a Koenigsegg? Yeah, a couple, couple of people have heard of Koenigsegg. They're, they're made in Sweden. Let's just say, for this illustration, that we go and I fall in love with one of the Koenigseggs, okay? It's a Koenigsegg CCXR Travita. Now, it, this particular car happens to be the most expensive um, uh, street legal production car made. And you have to slap down a cool 4.8 million to buy it. But that's no problem because I'm a preacher. Okay, so I slap down 4.8 million and I buy this, this Trevita and it, it has a maximum speed of 254 miles an hour. That'll get me to Pine Cove in less than a minute. <laughs> Actually, that will get me to New York City by 8 o'clock tonight <laughs> if I have a radar detector. Okay, the, the, this car, is, it's just gorgeous. Uh, the, the maker mixes carbon fiber and diamond dust for the, the coating. <laughs> I mean, I can't even afford the touch-up paint on this car. <laughs> okay, so let's just say I buy this car and I'm driving it around town. Now, now say Ben. He comes up to me and he says, you know what, uh, Drew and I, there's a special date and I want to really impress my, my lady. Can I borrow it for, from you? And I'm going, dude, it's my, it's my Trevita. You know, it's like, uh, I don't think so. I'll, be, I'll take real good care of it. Okay, he promised to take great care of it, so I, I, I give him the keys, and, and uh, he takes off, okay? So he and Rue are on this hot date, and Rue, being the, the person that she is, says, gun it, baby. So he guns it around a corner, <laughs> and he misjudges, and he wraps my Trevita around a telephone pole, okay? So there is what we call a breach between the relationship of Ben and I right now. <laughs> Paul hates to see this breach between Ben and I. And because Paul's a state worker, makes all kinds of money, he goes out and buys another exact replica of this $4.8 million Trevita. He goes to the DMV, waits all day, has the title put in my name, gives me the keys and the title and says, here, Bob, here. Now there is nothing in the way of a relationship between you and Ben. It's, it's as it was. What Paul has just done is he's made propitiation. He's covered over. He's atoned. That's the word that this extortionist is using. He is pleading for God to cover, to atone, not just to be merciful. It goes way beyond that. Because he knows he's got nothing to bring to the table. Uh, you know, because Ben's not a preacher or a state worker, there's no way he can put down $4.8 million to buy this car, okay? So he says, God, if you, unless you do something, I'm sunk. So be merciful. And then Jesus stuns his hearers with his conclusion. It's the extortionist who walks away justified, not the religious professional. No one saw that one coming at all. And then he adds one of those invert statements for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. That's why Jesus, he can say this because he's giving an invitation to you and me. And that invitation is to invert our whole approach to acceptance with God. And he's saying, abandon your idea that your validating performance record will ever be enough. Abandon that. And instead, humbly embrace this scandalous opportunity of receiving my validating performance record, says Jesus, and we'll make that swap. Christianity, at its core, it's an exchange. Where I exchange my good works, my validating performance record, I give that to Christ, and he gives me his record his validating performance record. It's transferred to my account. His record is perfect. No flaws, no slips, no sins. His, his record is bulging with courage and obedience and joy and connection with God. And all of that's put on my record if I will humbly say, I don't have it, I need it from you. And it takes humility to invert, always invert. 
that I'll never have enough, I'll never be enough, I'll never do enough on my own to be accepted. But I can humbly ask, God, you've made the offer through your son. Can I receive it? And although I can never do enough to be accepted, if I receive, if I make this exchange, there's a whole different attitude that begins to just flow from my life and it's an attitude of, of just sheer gratitude of what God has done for me. It's a robust humility to say, God, my life is now lived for you in gratitude. John Calvin says, the founder of the Presbyterian Church, he says it's, it's faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies, it's never alone. It's always accompanied by this wonderful gratitude. So if you choose to invert, if you just take your validating performance record and rip it up, or better yet, to say, Jesus, you can have that trash because that's what it is. And I will receive instead your record. You do that inversion. There will be a beauty of a God-authored, humble obedience that begins to flow from your life instead of a noxious, repulsive self-righteousness that revels in feeling superior to other people and, and sort of even approaches God with this idea, boy, aren't you lucky to have me on your team? You know, you just abandon all of that. And that extortionist, that tax collector in the parable, that's your patron saint. That's your patron saint. There is a relentless love from heaven that has your name on it and says, if you will humbly choose, you can make this exchange. Jesus Christ lived and he died and he rose again from the dead in order to give you and to give me that privilege of that exchange. You don't need to work anything up to receive it. In fact, that goes against what Jesus is trying to say. He's just trying to say, if you will humbly, humbly receive it. Acknowledge that you don't have it, but boy, did he ever. I'd love to lead us in prayer, and if there's anyone here this morning that's saying, okay, that Pharisee, that's me, or that's my tendency. Jesus, could you so work in my life to make me a whole lot more like the extortionist in that parable? Where humility just oozes from me? Where gratitude, based on what you've done for me, is just the norm of the day? Would you do that for me? Would you, would you give me that amazing Grace, would you do that? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you know that it's true that this parable is meaningful to me because it has been to me a call for years to abandon any idea that, that my record is just so much better than someone else's and so that's why you should accept me and that's why you should be proud of me. Lord, I think I'm not alone. And there is a, a beauty of a God-authored obedience that flows from gratitude that is just attractive. And so accordingly, Jesus, would you help us to humbly say yes to this exchange and to not just say it yes once, but to say it throughout the remainder of our lives, that it's just something that we continue to do. Lord, would you open our eyes to the immensity of this amazing opportunity, this amazing grace, and would you help us to say yes to it with every act, with every thought, from this day forward in Jesus' name, amen.